We are now welcoming to the program Dr. Stephen Porges, who is an expert. This is another layer. It's not Alan Shore, who you hear from on a future podcast. This Stephen Porges is, again, one of my heroes, and he has really developed the science of the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve and how that relates to emotional processing. You will see what I mean. It sounds like a mouthful, but he will make it understandable for you, I promise. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Dr. Who Podcast. Uh, today I am very excited. Uh, I am privileged to welcome to the program uh, a, a gentleman who has... I, I, I'm, Dr. Porges, are you there? I'm here, yes. Yeah, I, I want to gush about you for a second because I am a giant fan of your work and the observations that you've brought to light. Uh, I thought it was time we took your material to the public, which I know is going to be a little bit of a task because it's very physiological and very technical, but this is the future. Uh, of are, our, are we, are, we're offline now, No, right? no, we're on. We're on the we're air. On. We're oh, on. Okay. We're officially okay. on. I know it sounds okay. like I'm not talking a lot, but I am. Okay, then go ahead and gush. Go uh, right ahead. Yes. Uh, Dr. Borges, uh developed something called the polyvagal theory and it is uh i that may not be a term that is immediately apparent what it means to everybody but he basically has shown uh how a part of our central nerve well of our nervous system uh that has been ignored for a long time or at least marginalized may be at the core of understanding uh how i don't know how to describe this how our emotional landscapes work uh, I, I came to your work, Dr. Porges, through Alan Shore. I'm, I'm a humble disciple of his work, and oh. uh, his his work informed everything I do. And he is, a, by, by the way, Dr. Shore will be on in a couple of episodes to talk to you about his work. Uh, but he has been able to show, you know, how the emotional landscape is built, how the self is built, and how this is a, a we've missed the the fact that this is a bodily based experience. And that the autonomic nervous system, the sort of brakes and accelerator of our system, has been marginalized uh, in our understanding of this thing we call emotions and feelings. Is that a good way to sort of bring it to I life? Think it's, or... a, it's a good start. Okay. But I was actually going, if, if you don't mind me <laughs> bouncing in. And, Please, uh, bring it. Okay. Um, I actually uh, realized, I finally realized that you were trained as an internist. Yes, I'm a trained as an and, internist. And, and what I would say is, to start this, I would say that what I do is really the interface between internal medicine and psychiatry. Yes. So um, you should find yourself feeling very much at home with the linkage of the autonomic nervous system to uh, behavioral mental health disorders. Well, and it, it maybe that's why I ended up in addiction medicine, too, because that's a similar crossroad. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's very much, you know, medical. There's a lot of medical stuff going on. It's, there's neurobiology that's completely out of whack. There is interpersonal, there's dynamic issues, there's psychiatric issues, but ultimately it is about the body and the body's relation to the brain. And that is something that I think has been... And when people talk, for instance, you know, when I talk, I'm getting off topic completely right away here, but whenever I hear people talking about, you know, uh, computers or artificial intelligence, I immediately think, no, wait a minute, humans have this old other thing that they're embedded in that informs so much of what they're experiencing. Maybe it's all of what they're experiencing, but it also informs what they're thinking, how they remember things, uh, and how they process information. It's why there's things like intuition and why we have insights. It, those are actually are bodies creating those those sorts of moments, I suspect. Well, we are biological. I mean, that's what we are. And whatever we do, whether it's art or music or social interactions, it's really based on our biology. And this tends to be, you know, marginalized, this importance. And as you already realize that we live in a world that is very, I'll use the term cognitive-centric or cortical-biased. Yes. It's, it's being the same thing, that this little part of the brain that deals with our awareness and our alertness and our consciousness, we believe is the major role of our brain. And it's not really uh, to help our body run. And our, the way our body is functioning also feeds back and provides portals of accessibility to different mental uh, competencies. 
Well, let's try to talk about the vagus nerve and what you observe. Let, let, talk, talk about the polyvagal theory. I, by the way, I gave a lecture at the USC Medi- University of Southern California. Not, I know where you are. You're at Dr. Porges is a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina. Uh, by the way, you can find more information at Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S dot com. And the book, which will be on our website, is The Polyvagal Theory. Uh, I gave a lecture at not University of Southern Carolina, near you, University of Southern California, which uh, is our USC. And uh, I tried to tiptoe into your material. It was interesting because uh, I do think, I do use it so much in terms of helping people understand emotional regulation and uh, intersubjective experiences. And they were pretty receptive. I even wrote an exam question about it, which uh, is about you know, basically, you know, what is the polyvagal theory, basically, was my in a, in a national in a format that we're all accustomed to. But th- talk about what you observe, how you got into this. Well, I got in, I'll talk about the history of getting into it in a moment. But first, um, the theory is extraordinarily neurophysiologically based, but it's also intuitive. So now you have this balance between really deep science and the history of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology and the study of evolution on one side, and the other side, the intuition of this is, this is how we feel, this is how we act. And when you put those layers together, suddenly you demystify a lot of the unusual experiences people have had, especially those who have been traumatized or have severe mental health issues. Um, How I got into this is really uh, backwards. I think uh, we all get into things that interest us about feelings and uh, trying to understand our, our body, but we often go into a profession. So... I started off in psychology, and I was interested in physiological markers or parallels of psychological processes with kind of a a dream that you could put electrodes on people and you could uh, understand a lot about them without talking to them. Okay, so you could understand uh, a lot about their physiological states. And as I started to do my work, and this is actually now several decades ago, I start to ask more serious questions, not uh, simply were there correlates or relationships between autonomic activity and cognitive processes or emotional states, but what were the pathways, what were the neurophysiological pathways? I was actually trying to figure out how the system worked, and I had been studying heart rate patterns, and this may sound extremely uh, uh, boring to many of the listeners. But I was interested in how the nervous system was reflecting information uh, in the patterning of a heartbeat. And this becomes real when we start to understand that our heart is really governed in part by a large nerve that comes out of the brainstem called the vagus. So the vagus functions literally as a break. And people who are resilient and people who can engage others have good self-control tend to have good control, uh, vagal influences on the heart. So when they uh, uh, stand up and the heart rate accelerates, they can calm down rapidly with this vagal influence. And I got into this, uh, the whole polyvagal theory uh, started in the 1990s because I thought I had really done, made my major contributions. I had developed methodologies to measure vagal activity of the heart. And I was really having fun uh, measuring this activity in various clinical disorders from preterm babies, babies vulnerable for SIDS, to uh, hyperactive kids, to a whole variety of different populations. And I published a paper in a journal called Pediatrics, and I got a letter back from a neonatologist, and the letter um, was really quite interesting. It was a letter that said, I really enjoyed your paper, but it had the following phrase, however, and those of us who are in the academic world, <laughs> we always are very, very, uh, yeah. you know, this is where the however gets you. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a punch that follows. Right. So the point was, however, when I was in medical school, I learned that the vagus could kill you. And I was, uh, in my paper, trying to talk about the vagus as protective of preterm and full-term babies, and this was a good indicator of the developmental trajectory. And so I realized, uh, well, his final statement was, perhaps too much of a good thing is bad. And whenever someone says that, that simplistic explanation really deserves... Uh, uh, to unpacking, quite, unpacking. Yeah, attack, yeah. yeah. Unpack it, look at it, and see what it really means, because obviously you're looking at two different worlds. And in medical school, he's right. What people are taught is that the bradycardias or the apneas of preterm babies, they're vaguely mediated, and they can kill you. Babies, like, not, not adults so much, but babies. 
Not, well, it potentially can happen in adults also. But this literally got us sponged out of a lot of the literature. So just like a turtle or a reptile immobilizes under threat and their heart rates get, go very, very slow and they stop breathing because they have to go into water and reduce metabolic activity, preterm babies do this in, and except it's almost it's potentially lethal. They go into bradycardia. So their heart rates get very slow and they and, stop breathing. And, and let, me, let me hook this up right away and early in this story mm-hmm. to, so people can relate to it. It's also oftentimes what we do in extreme circumstances of terror. We go yeah. f- we go from hyper stimulation and fight or flight to hyper inhibition, where yeah. the body is going into a metabolically conservative state to anticipate. Like if you're standing in front of a lion, if that lion hits you, you're ready for it. You can no longer right. run away, but you're prepared. And it well, also at the same time. This is the connection that people will make. Is at the same time as that vagus nerve is putting out a bunch of stuff into the body, the brain is getting flooded with cortisol and uh, opioid blocking types of uh, chemicals. Right. So, so actually, it's raising pain thresholds, and people are dissociating and going someplace else. Oh. And what you'll find as the story unfolds is that this fits the description, as you're saying, of many people who have had been abused, been uh, suffer from PTSD. And there was no explanation about their symptoms because people thought it was all, quote, a stress response. And stress, people talk about as increased sympathetic activity and not vagal. And, but, and let, let me, to, again, I'm going to kind of, I, I, I don't want to lose people, so I'm going to jump in with stuff that sort of hooks it, hooks it back to, you know, everyday experience. You know, I think we all know, let's say when you fall in love, you feel a warm feeling in your chest or people point to their chest. The heart is the source of all kinds of feelings bodily-based feelings. We all know what we're talking about when we talk about that. Yet, when you talk about the brain, how does the brain get you to feel things in your heart? Well, if I remember part of your polyvagal theory theory is that something like 80% of the vagus is uh, going the other direction, right? Right. right. So it's, it's actually a feeling instrument as well. It's a feeling instrument, but it may be may not have the specificity. So when we get these feelings, we may have difficulty labeling it. It's a so feeling in our chest. Yeah. yeah. So we have, you know, some, we know we have a change, and we may not have a vocabulary or haven't developed a vocabulary to describe those feelings. Uh, the, the, you're right on target in the sense that this is a very primitive system. It's a defensive system. But this was not the vagal system that I was studying. Nor I. I. Studying, Nor yeah, I. It was, yeah. It was a protective vagal system. Well, uh, the vag- here's what it was. It, what you were studying the, the autonomic nervous system. Here's what happened in medical school. You yeah. studied the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, and you study the pharmacology of blocking the various ro- you know, various chemicals that come out of that system or the synaptic you know, the pathways right. in that system. And you go, oh, this one speeds things up. You block it. Things slow down. Mm-hmm. This one slows things down. You block it. Things speed up. That's about, that was the simplistic right. way right. we were. That, that's the extent, trust me, the extent of the autonomic nervous system training we had. Well, it becomes interesting when you look at the history. I want to just put one more point in, and that the type of vagal activity that this gentleman was describing was, in a sense, a potentially lethal response, but what I was studying was a protective response. So now we're back to the, the neonatologist or pediatrician, whatever right. who wrote, sent you right. that letter. Right, that yeah. created what I call the vagal paradox, and I had to figure this one out. And the answer really came out of studying the evolution of the autonomic nervous system in, in, uh, in vertebrates. And what happened is that literally we have we don't have a simple paired antagonistic system just like you described. We have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. We do have that, but they're not always at battle. We really have hierarchical systems that inhibit uh, other systems. So in a sense, we have a very ancient vagal shutdown response. We have a sympathetic mobilization fight flight, which inhibits the shutdown. And then we have this new mammalian vagus, which is linked to this, the muscles of the face and head. So when people are smiling, when there's good prosody in voice, and when their upper part of the face is alive, that's inhibitory of the sympathetics. So you can see you know, how the nervous system of social behavior and social interaction is the same as the nervous system that supports health. Make that connection for people again, because you, you packed a lot into that. So, so the, the 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 primitive primitive system, which yeah. is an unmyelinated system. It's an unmyelinated okay. system, but don't think of it merely as a system that creates. Uh, 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 it's, 
that's a lethal system. No, I, no, no, no. But it's the, it, it's the it system is. that we share with possums and reptiles. Oh, we, we yeah. share with reptiles. Yeah. We share with bony fish. Right. And, and uh, so, we, and it's, yeah. and it's, it's the, it's the escape when there is no other escape. It's the, it's, it's the, reduce, it's the, it's very simple. It reduces metabolic demands right. on our body. And, and, but, and when, yeah. but when it does so, it also activates dissociation, which is a very yeah. problematic psychological, neurobiological thing. We can talk right. about that later. But that, but that's the thing. That's the system of last resort. That's when there's no escape. Right. And those of us, uh, I should say many people, are fortunate that the system is triggered so they don't suffer pain in either dying or being abused. The, because they just disappear. The problem is when this becomes the predominant means of reacting to stress or unpleasant feelings, now you have a big problem. Absolutely. We evolve not to use this system for defense. We evolve to use the system uh, to support our homeostatic, our health and growth. And so the, the, this old unmyelinated vagus was there, and it's very important for our health, for our digestion. But when the system is being used as a defense system, we're in really deep trouble. And that largely goes, in addition to being able to do shutdown, it goes also below the diaphragm in terms of regulating. Below the diaphragm. Yeah. And, of course, when you mention this and start asking what are the internal medicine uh, symptoms of people who have problems, it's always going to be gut problems. Yeah, they have, they have irritable bowel, they have yeah. abdominal pain, they have all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah. And there's one other thing that's linked to this as well. The afferent branch of that vagus coming from the, the subdiaphragmatic area actually helps regulate nociceptive pain. So okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to yeah. translate that for you. So, <laughs> so the, the, ner- the information coming back from the gut through this old vagus yeah. changes pain perception. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so people who have problems with gut, who often have problems even with blood pressure regulation, also often have fibromyalgia. In which, uh, and, of course, people that are traumatized often have all kinds of yeah. pain syndromes. Yeah. Then, then there's the flight-or-fight response, which is the next layer, which is the s- predominantly sympathetic system, yes? Right, and we have to think of everything not as good or bad, but as being adaptive. And once we take that moral veneer off, then we can be helpful. So a lot of people are basically highly mobilized. They're literally in panic a good portion of the time. Many of those people have histories of being immobilized, right? In in and what what, and what Dr. Porges is talking about: sexual abuse, physical abuse, te- in particular, strangely enough, interpersonal terror, interpersonal stuff. Not just seeing a, it, it can happen seeing an explosion or a war or something, but it's particularly something of interpersonal terror, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but it's also even it interacts even with basically clinical medicine. Trauma by diagnosis. Oh, oh, I know. Listen, I, I was shocked one day when I was in a, you know, in California, we have to go to these pain conferences so, to keep up our license, and I went to one, and the director of the pain medicine program gets up and says, uh, you know, funny thing about these pain patients, somewhere around 96% of them are sexually or physically abused. Anyway, let's go on to talk to you how we're going to prescribe, how we're going to prescribe those opiates for those patients. Yeah, a, I mean, yeah. so what I've really, as, as the story starts coming out in terms of this hierarchical system, the symptoms that are clustered around uh, different levels of the polyvagal system, meaning this shut down old, unmyelinated, primitive vagus versus a sympathetic nervous system that turns off the subdiaphragmatic vagus, meaning you get constipated, you're tightly wrapped, you're anxious person who's constipated, and but the face is now flat, but versus the person whose face is animated and who has lots of vagal activity to the heart, they're basically a much more integrated individual. Okay, so now we're move, moved up to the mammalian, what you call the mammalianated, yeah. ma- mammalian or myelinated system, which is something that evolves in relation to the branchial pouches, which is where our face and our and our all of our. How do you help people understand this? All, all everything well, you see above the neck sort of evolves in the same area. <laughs> well, all all the uh, type of muscles that are called striated muscles of the face and head. Come, uh, the control comes from the same area that regulates this newer vagus. Okay, so the stuff, the, the facial nerve material, which it regulates yeah. the face, is 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 related to the source of this new vagus. Yeah. Now, what this means is we wear our heart on our face. And this and that source is something called the nucleus ambiguus, if I remember right. right. Yeah. And of course, how do we wear our feelings and our heart on our face? We, uh, in terms of uh, how our facial muscles work but also in terms of 
the prosodic or the intonation of her voice. And you said so, something very interesting, too. There's even a relationship between the muscles that adjust the ossicles in our ear and yeah. the vagus. But, but you've done your homework. I, yes. <laughs> oh, I love your material. Are you uh, sure? Uh, I read your stuff like scripture, I'm telling you. Wow. Well, I, I, I'm more than flattered. Uh, but we'll discuss that offline. <laughs> but basically, uh, the middle ear, the, one of the defining features of mammals that most people don't realize is detached middle ear bones. And that enabled mammals through the through uh, during uh, the transition from reptiles to mammals enabled the mammal to survive by literally having a a, a niche to communicate vocally that the reptiles couldn't hear because their middle ear bones didn't detach. And and then we could literally adjust our our yeah. t- attunement to those prosodic changes well, through- only only if we're in safe environments. Because if we're not in safe environments, we want to hear those big reptiles. Now, you mentioned that the animated face is an important piece of the vagal function. Uh, are you? You must be familiar with Peter Fonagy and his his stuff. Uh, a little bit. Well, little. he he puts a lot on uh, the back and forth facial expression mm. and, and what that is communicating to a child. And and I think I I overlaid your theory on his and said and then thereby activating this vagal function. Yeah, if it's reciprocal and it becomes a neural exercise, and this is really the word I like using now, that talk therapy or social interactions or just being with another human being, talking, listening, engaging, smiling, these are neural exercises of this face-heart connection. Isn't that interesting, face-heart connection? That's a fascinating way to say it, because, again, when you say face-heart, immediately everyone intuitively knows when you bring your heart into an experience that it's some, again, bodily-based, emotional, feeling-based right. experience. And what he says is, he, he says that, he, he looks at mothers and infants, and he says, you know, the infant is awash in feeling states. They can't, doesn't have language yet necessarily, can't identify the feelings, can't regulate the feelings. And the first thing the child is is an object of scrutiny by the mom. And the mom tries to attune to the child's um, biological state, and then read it, like what's the content of the child's mind. And then he says, when, when as soon as she knows, it's something that was, uh, it was Winnicott or somebody said, which is uh, that mom looks like what she sees. In other words, what she perceives to be going on in the child's mind, it immediately becomes reflected on her face. Mm-hmm. Not that she is uh, reflecting to the child her constitutional state. The mom doesn't catch the feelings of the child, but she's reflecting an appreciation of the child's primary emotional state and then then that exchange becomes a means for developing emotional regulation i i totally agree but there are a couple important points here um if you recall back about uh 20 or 30 years ago or well you're not that old but earlier in your medical career that was 30 years ago (laughs) i'm that old there were um uh preterm babies were abandoned oh yeah uh, Oh, yeah. And the, re- the reason for that was the parents felt that the child didn't love them. Oh, wow. Or, or one, of the, one, of the enga- one of the aspects. And when I ask my medical students and graduate students, what do parents of autistic children, parents of severely hyperactive kids, and parents of preterm children often say? They say, I love my child, but my child doesn't love me. And this goes back to this paradigm you're describing. Because in all those uh, populations, those clinical populations, the face is not working. Is it also, though, that some, it, which is first, the chicken or the egg, that they don't no. appreciate what the content of others' minds and don't reflect it, or they can't attach that vagal mechanism? They, it's, it's, the, so, it's the attachment, because the children have feelings, yeah. and the system is just poorly organized, mm. and the cues that the parent is picking up may not be truly represented. It, representative of the child's state have we have we now sort of we've sort of walked through the polyvagal theory right pretty much yeah. okay yeah how does the polyvagal theory relate to attachment can you make that understandable to people uh, i okay so I, I what i like to say is you don't just have attachment you have a preamble to being attached and whether we're talking about with infants or we're talking about uh, peer-peer relationships you have to be providing signals to the other uh, in a reciprocal way that signals safety. Okay. And then you get proximity. 
Okay. See, see, see I, you, you're yeah. talking. It's, it's funny. You know, we're talking about some. Again, I'm trying to make it relatable for people. We're talking about very specific biological, organismic sorts of experiences, but they these are the substrate for intimacy. This is how we okay. we build closeness with other humans. And by the way, in closeness, we build the capacity for emotional regulation. We find meaning. We find love. We find self. And all of this stuff you're talking about is the requisite for those nice things to happen. Would you agree? I totally agree, but I also say it supports general health because we have an overlapping circuit with the social behavior we're describing with the neural mechanisms that promote health. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to take a quick break, uh, and uh, we'll be right back with more of Dr. Stephen A. Steve, Stephen W. Porges, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but you can call me Steve. Is okay. there a Stephen A. Porges, too? Who knows? I th- Who knows? Because <laughs> I saw, saw the W on everything. I thought, and then the A sounds funny. Uh, the, the, Dr. Porges, we've sort of walk, we sort of walked through the polyvagal theory. You have a new book, by the way, coming out called Clinical Applications of Polyvagal Theory. When is that coming out? I can't wait to see that. Well, it's actually, it should be the, the second part of the title, which is the transformative power of feeling safe. Um, and you meant, you yet. just mentioned feeling safe is what what you think this builds. Yes. Yeah. Everything about in my work now is about the triggers to our nervous system that enable us to feel safe. And that when we feel safe, what we, what we get from that in terms of the accessibility of different uh, cognitive functions, different emotional functions, and health. And everything, uh, so not being scared is not the same thing as feeling safe. Right. And, and in part, the medical community has kind of missed this because they're very driven by pharmaceutical treatments. And drugs can, in a sense, dampen certain systems, but they don't necessarily potentiate the systems that we need to be more engaging. I'll tell you, in inter- in uh, interpersonal therapies, when people are dealing, uh, particularly emotionally based interpersonal therapies, you know, uh, uh, marriage and family therapy, that kind of thing, the number one thing I always hear people saying is, "I don't feel safe." I don't feel. They say it many different ways, but what they're really saying is, "I don't feel safe in this relationship." You don't make me feel safe. Yeah, and I think this is the basis uh, for all all mammalian relationships. Uh, mammals have to sleep. They have to be in, in, in environments. They have to eat a lot. They have to defecate. They have to do a lot of behaviors that require immobilization and loss of hypervigilance. So they have to feel safe. And if you think of that in terms of the clinical disorders that people have in terms of ingestive and digestive processes, it's merely representing that their nervous system isn't safe. And you don't make a person safe by telling them to be safe. Their body is doing the decoding. Right. And now you wanted to mention something about language versus speech. Yeah. So, again, we live in this very strange time where everything is syntactically driven, word-driven. So people use Twitter, they use email, and they don't convey the prosodic, the intonation of voice. But we evolved. Mammals evolved not with language but with vocalizations. And the vocalizations were to convey the physiological state of the other so that we knew we were safe to come together. So all mammals will vocalize, and the vocalizations are really conveying their physiological state. And what I'm going to, since you, you're, you were trained, I, this, I'm going to tease you, but uh, you were trained in neuroanatomy for that course you took. Remember that oh, one? Oh, I remember that one. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So there's a, there's a nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's actually a branch of the vagus. Yes, it's the one we worry about when we're doing thyroidectomies. Yeah, yeah. Well, it also c- it controls a degree of prosody, and so it parallels the vagal influence to the heart is coming through in prosodic features. Hmm. So not only do we wear our heart on our face, we're literally, literally projected in the intonation of our voice. So, and let, let's think of another way of communicating that. Is it so our feelings get communicated through our voice? Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, Darwin acknowledged this in, in his book on emotions in, in men and, and animals. In a sense, high pitch, narrow. Uh, high, okay, so if you talk to someone and their voice is a high pitch and it doesn't really have, uh, it's, a, it's like a shrill voice, what do you know about that person? They're anxious or they're upset. Right. Yeah. And what about their muscle tone when you look at high, them? High tone, I think. Right. Yeah. And what if they're uh, using a very low voice and they're barking and yelling? It's kind of like a rage response. Yes, right? and rage can but be rage can be go both ways. Yeah, well, rage can actually go low. Yeah, too. yeah. yeah. Uh, and so what? 
social communication is in between those boundaries, and our nervous pick, nervous system picks up that information. Singing must be in the on the spectrum too. It'd be interesting oh. to check the vagal tone of of uh, comfortable singers. It's probably. Pro- oh, I I looked at your web page, so I <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And you know, uh, what do mothers do to their babies uh, to make them feel calm before they understand language even? They, they sing, sing to them, them, yeah. They sing to and, them. And they don't sing in complex songs. It's very simple uh, lullabies within a certain frequency band. And if we think about those frequencies, this is exactly what the classical composers use to introduce their melodies. Oh, oh interesting. So, so, so as, I, as I add up the score here, it's that yeah. we we are very focused on communicating with language yeah. Yet, yet we've lost track of the rich communication through our facial expression and our vocal intonation. And where are we going in our society? More towards the, you know, that's why you can't have a real relationship uh, in an Internet, you know, in a chat okay. room. Okay, and where are we going with our educational system? Oh, we're, listen, I get that same lecture I gave to the medical school the other day. Yeah. Uh, I they he I, I would know they put them all in a smaller classroom because the mayor had the bigger classroom and he said yeah they'll they'll fit in there there's only about eighty of them I said isn't the class one hundred ninety kids yeah 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 the other one hundred ten are watching it on a podcast mm-hmm. yeah it's just amazing because we're so uh, cognitive centric but if we had more social interactions more play more music more all uh, you know drama all these things that require reciprocal interactions we'd be building through neural exercises, and that's what those interactions are, more resilient kids who would then have greater access to their cognitive structures. This is a big deal, and it's been completely ignored. I've, I've, I've been talking about this. I try to talk about this a lot when I'm out in the world, and, and it just doesn't, you know, because people are so traumatized, I think they're fearful of uh, even hearing this message. Well, another way of saying is we're being, uh, the people who uh, have difficulty in face-to-face social interaction are creating the agenda for other people's social interaction. They are, but in the meantime, we're we're use, losing the richness and meaning that humans have have relied upon mm-hmm. throughout human history. I mean, read any great novel or drama or whatever it is, it, or listen to a great symphony, whatever it is, it's all there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I get a little disheartened by by that. Um, any? Um, oh shoot! I wanted to ask you something else about the. Uh, the vocal part. Ah, I lost it. You want are, middle ears? Well, are people are people responding to your theories? Are, are physicians picking it up and uh, going with it? Um, and it's really it's a, okay. It's been an interesting journey because I come out of very traditional academics, and I'm one of the few people who is still literally a, a laboratory scientist doing research who's talking to all these uh, other groups, you know, clinical groups all around the world. And it's been very interesting to watch this at one side and then to watch the medical community on the other. So within the past month, I talked at UC San Diego uh, Neuroscience in their medical school, and then I talked at Dartmouth. Uh, But in general, I talk much more to, like, uh, family. uh, So I talked to the Erickson uh, Erickson Foundation Couples Group in in, uh, Manhattan Beach a couple weeks ago. So those the clinicians are very excited. Uh, the academic physicians are becoming excited because there's strong science behind it. Uh, the problem w- within psychiatry, from my perspective, is psychiatry is so drug-oriented in terms of treatment that they lost the interaction with the with the patient. Completely. Oh, it's, it's not valued at all. But the whole medical system has is, is lost that. Uh, thankfully, there are ancillary disciplines showing up that are pick, picking this piece up, though, I think. Well, and the fact is that people are seeking those because they like the social interaction. So the metaphor that I kind of use is that there are, you know, master clinicians regardless of their training. Right. But the master clinicians understand all these principles intuitively. Right. And the rest of us are having it sort of expunged from our practice. <laughs> yes. It's true. And, and it really, I, my thing is that this is so, uh, I know what I want to ask you. I remember now. Does your theory in any way inform... I've always wondered why humans like watching other sick humans act out. <laughs> why we, you know, if you look at any... If you look at any great tragedy or great opera or now reality TV shows, you're really looking at sick people acting sick. 
Does this theory in any way help us understand why people do that, why we look toward that? Well, I would think in terms of opera, you know, I would go with the you're being led by the music, and the music is... But it's, but it's dramatic music about horrible things, <laughs> tragedies, yeah, and people misbehaving, but, and drawing death and violence. But, but it's pulling you in um, with the prosodic uh, orchestra. Oh, I get that. I get that. I yeah. just wonder why, uh, I why it couldn't understand. be about people behaving nicely and being boring. We have, I mean, uh, what is it that um, makes it interesting to us, and does, and does this theory oh, somehow inform that? Um. I, I get you know this is a guess. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. It's good. I won't <laughs> okay. tell your academic colleagues you've been guessing. You know, this is a guess, but this is actually uh, what I this guess I think will inform us over time about the effects of trauma. I think certain things occur under a one trial learning a set of one trial learning rules, and that people have forgotten about single trial learning. That was for like taste aversion, people who used to get chemotherapy if they ate something, they could never eat that again. Yes. Okay? Yes. So single trial exposure, it's not a repeated association. It's something different. And trauma carries a lot of those things. And But neurophysiologically, all that single trial learning from that old literature is autonomic. Yes. Okay, so what we're doing with listening to the sad music is we're triggering an autonomic system yes. and hopefully triggering empathy. But I think you were asking something different than empathy. You were actually asking, like we reality TV shows tend not to elicit empathy. Right. Why well, was well, schadenfreude a little bit, but why, yeah. why, why say, I, I understand it intuitively that it's more exciting, more arousing, and as such sort of gets our attentional mechanisms going. But why sick people? <laughs> well, I think there are two different things going on. The music is not arousing in the sense that you're talking about. It's pulling people in with pathos. That, that makes the, the music part makes perfect sense to me. That, let's that's move easy. that to the side yeah. and talk about reality TV. Okay. And I think that's more like roller coaster riding. Okay. I think it, I think yeah. it's coming close to someone's tragedy and then being able to turn it off. It's it's like spinning in the chair. It's just self stimulating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a controlled exposure. Yeah. Because you can always walk away. Yeah. Uh, but the music, even in the in the opera, you can't walk away. You're not allowed to. There's social constraints once you sit down in that music hall. Well, not only the social there's there's musical constraints. You you don't yeah. you know you don't get let go until you're back at tonic in a very some some sort of dramatic way. Back right, at the tonic right. key. Yeah. Well, Doctor Porges, I want to thank you so much for joining me. It's really been a privilege and, and a pleasure, and uh, you're everything I expect you to be, and uh, helping me sort of expose the average person to some of these thinking. I, I think we laid it out in a way that um, people can access it, and and I, I hope they can contextualize it because you know as a as clinicians and as a physician, the, the context of this for me was uh, awakening. It was just immediately obvious how it all fit in with things I was seeing and exper- you know, particularly with addicted and traumatized populations. Uh, and and then my, it informed how I approach patients with the, the, the prosodic voice and the facial expressions. The other, the other piece that the face does that you may appreciate as a psychologist is it sets a boundary. Yeah. It, and it, and it sig- it's a signal without a contagion. Uh, and it's it's very it's built into us, and a lot of people don't don't appreciate that that they they have these nonverbal ways of communicating that are received on a different level and and are done in such a way that there's this boundary between the self and the other. Uh, the website is stephenporges.com. The Stephen is with a ph. It's p o r g e s. The book is the polyvagal theory. I didn't read you the uh, the the second subtitle because I was afraid we were going to scare people <laughs> off. But Not it's time. neurophysiological time. foundations of emotions, attachment, communication, and self-regulation. And the new book we'll be looking forward to is clinical applications of the polyvagal theory. I will get please, you guys, got to put the polyvagal theory up on our website. It's which we on will. The site. Good. And uh, it's if I if I read it right, it's really a, a series of essays, is it not? It's it's pa- papers you've compiled and sort of integrated. Yes. Right. The yeah. first book, but the second book is going to be ri- is being written for normal people. It's, it's going to be more conversational and more translational. Beautiful. I can't. Would you mind coming back again when that comes out? We'll we'll pump it. I I certainly would love to. Thank Beautiful. you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Doctor Porges. This is Corolla Digital. Welcome, Dr. 
Not True Podcast. In just a second, I'll be welcoming my guest, Dr. Stephen Porges. But before I do, uh, I want to just uh, show off to my boss. That's you. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love the Bill Cosby music, man. It's nice, right? Yeah. Well, here's what you can do. If you really have that music, you can go to drdrew.com or iTunes and get the swing and sounds of the Dr. Drew Podcast and mm. put a little wind in the sails of the Corolla Sweet. Network. Or... Um, what else? You can support the people that support this show, people like Lavocracy and Go to Meeting, which you hear about later, later stamps.com. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These are all people that support this product. And if you use and support the show, support, support, the, the, show, product. support yeah. the product, being the Corolla Network. And also, you can look at the Go Buy the Boy with the Gun by Brandon Stosdell. It's available on Amazon. Click through at doctor.com. Or just whatever you need to buy, click through. The Amazon link at drdrew.com. Mm-hmm. like that. Sell or that. the Adam and Drew Show.com site, mm. too, as well, right? Sell it, man. Is that good? Mm-hmm. I get to awesome. keep doing this? Yeah. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. I can cut All you right. off. Mm-hmm. When? When? We'll see. When? We'll see. Okay. Uh, so, here's the deal. The reason the great Mr. Adam Kroll is here today is my guest, Dr. Stephen Porges. He's written uh, extensively. He's a professor of psychiatry at University of North, Carol- North Carolina. He, his book is The Polyvagal Theory, Neurophysiological Foundations of Emotions, Attachment, Communication, and Self-Regulation. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. And the reason I asked Mr. Corolla to stay behind is I've always been of the opinion that the quality of the attachment you had with your parents, Adam, mm-hmm. had a profound impact on your autonomic nervous system. Mm-hmm. Uh, literally the part of, and, and I believe emotions are deeply embedded in our autonomic, and Dr. Porges will, will explain this in just a second, because he has worked it out from a standpoint of embryological development mm-hmm. and how that, and also evolutionary development, and how these layers of ancient systems of autonomic functioning, both sympathetic and parasympathetic, affect what's where our emotions are embedded. And in your case, you did not get the right mirroring and stimulation, and so you never developed a pulse. Mm. You, your vagal tone remained, either your sympathetic tone remained low or your vagal tone remained high. I'm not sure which it is. Mm. I'm going vagal. Vagal? I don't know. I don't know the sympathetic and the vagal. I don't know Okay, the difference. Sympathetic, is, sympathetic is traditionally thought of as the accelerator, the thing that mm-hmm. raises your heart rate, increases your skin tone, increases muscle tone. The, the vagus nerve is traditionally thought of as just a single major outflow from, right from the brain, while mm-hmm. the sympathetic system is all along our spine and goes out into our body from uh-huh. along the spine. The vagus comes straight out of our brain, goes primarily to the heart and the plexus here in the, the sternal area, mm-hmm. and it slows, traditionally thought of as slowing things down. But Dr. Porges, who well, I welcome at this time, Dr. Porges? Am I doing okay so far? Uh, you're doing great. Okay. So I'm enjoying I, it. I asked, I, I'm going to I've got a, so much to talk to you about, and thank you for joining us. I, I always get excited when you come in. Uh, I asked Adam to stay behind because I wondered if you could sort of do a little assessment of him. Uh-huh. God knows we would talk about it forever afterwards. But I've, sure. his pulse wrists at about 48. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, because I've watched the shows over the years, and I even saw Adam in a movie. I'm not sure if anyone else saw that movie. How did it do? Which movie? Um, Talking the, about The Hammer? The Hammer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, the people who saw it liked it. Yeah, I <laughs> think it was the, a great movie. There weren't many it, of you. <laughs> but really, it kind of reflected the same things that I believe that Dr. Drew's mentioning. This is this ability to be calm. Yes. Even even in the challenge of uh, what might be viewed as adversity, or whether it's verbal or physical. So no, not not movie, even not even calm, Dr. Porges, but he actually... And, and, I, and I'm not even meaning to be complimentary. It might sound complimentary. He perceives things in the environment because of this. The rest of us don't see because he's. it's almost like time is slowed down all the time. So if a fly lands across the room, he's uh-huh. he, he's focused on it, distracted by it, doesn't increase his pulse rate, even if that is a mountain lion approaching. He still stays the same, but, but it's constantly taking the stuff in. Well, it's very interesting because he may, in a sense, uh, it's, some of the models of martial arts. Yeah. I, I wonder Ooh, whether or yes, not he uh, is using breath in a way that most of us don't. So if he really emphasizes slow exhalation and resp- respiratory cessation. And I don't, gets, not intentionally. Yeah. It, it, this is all remnants of his attachment stuff, sort of being kind of abandoned throughout his childhood. Well, hold, hold on. I don't, I don't work. First off, my son... For what it's worth, breathes like this. 
<laughs> like, like, he like, holds it in. Yeah. It's like he's taking a bong load every breath. <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, I don't intentionally do any kind of regulation but uh, of my breathing fo- or anything else. I just went to a football game with your son, and he, got, and he got very excited by stuff. His pulse went up. I told yeah, you he likes punting. Yes. He likes yeah, punting. Yeah, but you, you gave enough clues about your son in terms of the way he breathes that if he, he does that inhalation without a slow exhalation, he's turning off the this vagal inhibition or slowing up. So he's actually promoting anxiety states or mobilization states. Mm. Yeah, as far as me, uh, you know, the best way to describe me is if there's five people standing around on a street corner and I'm one of them and a car drives by and backfires, four people will jump uh-huh. and I won't. Okay, now here's, I'm going to ask Dr. Drew this. I will feel the backfire, uh-huh. I just won't jump. Well, you, not only will you feel it, you'll, you'll be able to tell us who was driving the car. Right. You'll be noticing everything, too. The rest Probably. of us are just distracted. Go ahead, Dr. Porges. Okay, so I was going to ask, since you two of you have spent a lot of time together, who, oh, speaks, yes. with, who speaks with longer phrases in terms of time? <laughs> <laughs> well, Drew can't think of that much to say. <laughs> well, in terms of I, the phrasing, it might actually might be longer in phrasing, but in terms of time speaking, Adam wins out by about yes. six orders of magnitude. Okay, so what I'm basically giving you is an example of a neural exercise of increasing the vagal inhibition on the heart, which is to expand the duration of exhalation. Mm-hmm. So if you have longer phrases, that's what you're doing. And mm-hmm. when you have anxious people or people who speak in very short, staccato-like phrases, they're actually changing their physiological state. And, in fact, both of you have had lots of guests in various forms. You've interviewed them, and the way they, uh, the, the duration of their phrases, tell you a lot about how well they can regulate their behavior. Now, let me, let me ask this. So I speak in longer phrases because I am an anxious person, and perhaps the longer phrases calms me so I can think and reflect as I'm talking, right? Well, now, he said uh, staccato I'm for inter- anxious. I'm going to in- interrupt you <laughs> Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, the, you may be gasping for air in, while you're still doing your phrase. Yes, because I'm an anxious so person. Right? Yeah, but if you Adam doesn't speak that way, so his words are coming out of the same breath. Interesting. Did you ever do skin diving or anything like that? Did you? Uh... No, I mean I didn't oh, have access right, to an ocean. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay. Much. See, I I wouldn't go to the skin diving. Uh, what I would say is, did you play a wind instrument? Did you sing? Did you do no? Uh, no, uh, no, I didn't. Oh, I know what you did. You. You held your breath underwater to hide from people, right? I could hold I could hold my breath for an exceedingly yeah. long period of time and yeah. stay underwater for a long period of time. Yeah, yeah, yes. but yeah, yeah. I was good at that. Yeah. Well, was that a metaphor for hiding from people? No, uh, no. I, 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 I don't, I don't know. You, you know, I, I didn't have access to a ton of swimming pools. Either so it wasn't something like I, uh, that I could do on a on a regular basis, ah. but I was just a I was good at that. I was good at holding my breath and you know swimming from one end of the pool to the other end underwater. I am not surprised. Say. Yeah, you're you're all slowed. Everything slowed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's as if you uh, figured something out at an early age. About See, you to... keep you keep uh, Doctor Porter uh, giving it to him coming upon this. I'm saying. I think it has something to do with his attachment style because he complains constantly about how traumatic it was growing up because uh, of the neglect. Oh, but, you know, uh, that that rolls off my back because everyone uh, thinks they came out of a dysfunctional family. Well, Adam you know. certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, describe it as traumatizing. Drew describes it as traumatizing. Uh-huh. I, I kind of describe it as nothing. Uh, well... Yeah, you know, we all adapt to things in different ways. So my strategy in my dysfunctional family growing up was uh, when I played the clarinet, which was slow exhalations and uh, going through chromatics and tones. It was a type of pram- pranayama yoga, and you may have uh, fallen onto something very similar to that. that without girlfriend, n- yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> without needing that type of instrument. Um, I, I, you know, all I can say about me is I found sports early and often. I had an incredible sense of balance, which made me good at all sports almost immediately, but not 
I didn't keep excelling. I just got as good as I was going to get in the first five minutes. Uh-huh. And I was I had eyes in the back of my head. Okay, right. And and uh, and Dr. Portis, again, I've studied your stuff like scripture, and and my understanding is part of the embryological origin of the vagal system, and particularly I think yeah. the newer vagal system, if I remember right, ties into the even the muscle tone in the inner ear that helps sort of tune. I thought you were saying to the prosodic sort of. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. But it can be on both. Okay, so it's the, it's the middle ear muscles. It's because of all these uh, muscles of the striate, striate muscles, the muscles on your face for facial expression, the muscles that give you prosody in your voice also are the link to the same system that enables you to hear voices. So if we look at Adam, Adam may have been listening for voices or listening to people. You know, he may have developed that strategy for his own self-regulation. Because he could, because there wasn't any. He was sort of trying uh, to... The question that I would have in dealing with this, I mean, this is kind of fun, not seeing either one of you face-to-face, but the, the issue would have been whether or not in his environment he felt he had to be hypervigilant. And it doesn't sound like he felt he had to be hypervigilant. It's more like he was curious. And no, I, I I am very curious, but I did feel like I had to be hyper vigilant. Because be- why? Because I felt like I lived in an environment that was vulnerable. Meaning, you, you didn't feel safe. I didn't feel safe, yeah. and I didn't feel like anybody in my vi- environment, mainly my parents, would protect me if anything bad had happened. So if an intruder had broken into the house at, at age seven in the middle of the night, it was every man for themselves at the but Corolla see, I, house. See, see, to me, that combo is what's so interesting about Adam. So he's understimulated, and whether he was, by whatever mechanism he arrived at that, his pulse was zero, and hypervigilant simultaneously. I, uh, I sort of understand and experience hypervigilance as a sympathetic high tone. Yeah. And he does not have a sympathetic tone associated with his vigilance. Yeah, so that this type of calmness while attending is not a calmness for uh, mobilization. So that you know what you're talking about is in your state when you become hyper vigilant, you're preparing to mobilize. Yes. Now Adam is describing uh, at least his physiological state now is a physiological state of uh, of attending and pulling out information but not in preparation of mobilization. Is it? Is uh, it? But he doesn't freeze either. Do you have a freeze no, response? No. Let's say somebody did break down. Would you freeze at him? No. I, you know, I, all I can really judge is, you know, when I do uh, a lot of my automotive racing, yeah. if the car gets out of control yeah. and starts spinning or starts, I can feel the rear end coming around. Your pulse goes from 52 to 58. <laughs> Um, no, actually, what I do normally to correct the problem is let go of the steering wheel, uh-huh. uh, which does correct the problem nine, eight, eight times, seven times out of ten. When your car starts getting loose, you, I can show you film of me driving. Like, you feel the rear end coming around. There's a sort of, oh, shit feeling, like, uh-oh, I broke loose. It's coming around. I physically let go of the wheel. The car corrects itself. And then I continue, but I never yank it one way or the other. I had a driving instructor tell me once, I was the calmest person to ever see drive a race car, and he told me, letting go of the wheel is great. It works great, but Just, don't do it during the race because if someone hits <laughs> you, you're not holding on to the wheel. Okay, so what I would ask you, Adam, on a clinical level was, was there a shift developmentally? Was there a period of time where you were hypervigilant and mobilized and then shifted into this? as you became more competent as a human being. No, I don't think I was ever mobilized. I've I've, I've had the I've I've always been whatever's happening is happening. It's never it's it, it never causes this sense in me. I I I it's not that I'm impervious to anxiety. Um really? I do have anxiety. I don't have anxiety. If 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 okay. if I got a text message from my wife and it said we need to talk 
now. Yeah. Get hold of me as soon as possible. Right, feel I would yeah. feel, whoa, whoa, what's going on? What yeah. did she find out? What's, yeah. what, what's she angry would, about? Would yeah. you feel any physiology with that? Would you feel a palpitation in your heart? Would you feel Yeah, anything? I think I would. There would be a physio- not physiological. Not nearly what I would have. Maybe not what Drew would have. <laughs> but his wife's a little bit of a ball bust. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, but for me... I drive, like, you know, I get in a car, I have my buddy Mike drive, he drives like a fucking maniac, and I just sit there messing with the radio. Drew sits in the back seat and screams, slow down. So, uh, can we get into an accident? Yes. Uh, do I feel, I don't feel anything yeah. from it. He has way less physiological response than the rest of us. Well, that's probably, you know, you're both of you, you're very different than each other. Yes. But I'm reminded that uh, when I was at the University of Illinois in the Department of Psychiatry, a friend of mine and I taught a seminar on social anxiety. Mm. And she, she, she was a, uh, a CBT, a cognitive behavioral therapist who dealt with anxiety. And she was, I didn't know what she was talking about because I don't suffer from social anxiety. I don't suffer from anxiety giving talks or things like that. I suffer anxiety in terms of preparation or other types of things, but not the types of things where people pass out in front of others. Right. And so, so Adam has some of the same things. I guess for you, um, watching Drew is a new world for you. Well, I can tell you, like you, possibly like you, if I'm going to do the Tonight Show, I will pace around yeah. my dressing room. And if you ask me, when do you want to do this, my answer is right now. Right yeah. now, because I'm pacing and I'm mm-hmm. uncomfortable. The second the band fires up, my name gets announced, and I walk on stage, I feel nothing. Yeah. I feel no anxiety at all the second I'm on stage. The worst yeah. thing you can do to me is put me in the dressing room and tell me two hours before you go out on stage. I then pace. I'm not, I wouldn't call my, I would, I'm not having a panic attack, but I am pacing. Yeah. As soon as yeah. I get on stage, it's gone. There's another interesting piece of this, too, is that I don't know about you, but I, I am hyper attentive to other people's faces. Like, I'm, I'm aware that I can discern minuscule muscular reactions in people, other people's faces, and I'm interpreting it. I'm like reacting to it, almost almost bodily-based reactions. I, I, I was aware of that in therapy, that I was like, oh, well, I can't believe I'm focusing on this poor woman. I feel responsible yeah. for other people's... But are you? can you really discern, are you constantly aware of minus, minuscule movements of the facial musculature? Oh. Yes, I, I am in... I mean, I mean, when I look at people, I yeah. don't know. I normally look at my feet, but I, I normally see. I can't take my eyes off people. Tuned in to not so much the physical, but the entire package. You know, I've, okay, I've, I've, let me interrupt you. If yes. You mind. Yeah. What about vocalizations and prophecy? Because yeah. we're, we're we're on a podcast, we're on a phone. Yeah, yeah. We don't see people's faces. Yeah. Uh, how do either of you pick up uh, intentionality of others, uh, comfort zones with other people? Uh, I think we are both exquisitely aware of that. And we, we've wondered if it was from listening to radio so long. We literally have – I'm aware that I have bodily-based responses to other people's affect as it is transmitted through sound. I do, uh-huh. I do two things. First off, I'm at parties all the time, and the wife yells out, Steve! And I'm talking to Steve, and Steve just keeps talking, or I keep talking. And then they go, Steve, and I go, hey, Steve, what? A person you're married to is calling your name right now. And he goes, what? It is? And I go, my name's not Steve, but I definitely recognize your name. Okay, and you your wife is calling you. So go, I cannot filter. I sit yeah. in restaurants, okay. and I say, okay. I love this song. And people go, I don't even know there's music playing. Right. And I go, okay. Go. Okay, yeah. so now, actually, you need to be tested for your advantage. Can you hear well from both ears? Do you think you hear okay from both ears? Yes. Okay. So I have this problem also, but I have it, I think, because I had a mastoid infection when I was eight years old, and I lost hearing in my right ear for years. Mm. And the eardrum, you know, uh, got repaired over time, but it didn't respond appropriately. So I started basically being a left biased listener. Mm. And so I then had to do all the filtering at higher levels, which mm. is what you're saying, Adam. You hear everything, but you basically have to prioritize it. Yes, so I hear this everything. Is the question, uh, first of all, how old are you, Adam? I'm 49. Okay, how do you deal with noisy environments now? Um, I, I'm, I'm 
very annoyed and agitated for the most <laughs> okay. part. I hate That's... going into a restaurant okay. where they're pumping the music. It's, I find it wildly distracting. Okay. And now, with healthy middle ear muscles, when I talk about healthy, I'm talking about teenagers, uh, when a human voice is uh, spoken or sung you know, with vocals, the middle ear muscles contract, and basically the low-frequency loud noises that dominate our acoustic environment bounce off our eardrums, and we hear human voice. We have two muscles that can tighten mm-hmm. and yeah. reduce the, the, it, muscula- the, it, the it, drum. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a kettle drum being tightening the skin, and mm-hmm. that's what our eardrum is, and only the higher frequencies of voice are absorbed, and the lower frequencies bounce off. It's like pulling a rubber band. Interesting. But, but if we don't do that, then we're picking up the lower frequency sounds that uh, trigger our nervous system a predator. Mm-hmm. And as we get older, the ability to filter this out, either with those neural regulation of the muscles or cognitively, uh, gets a little bit challenged, so we become irritable. And we start mm-hmm. selecting quiet restaurants. We don't want to go certain places. Uh, and, in fact, uh, this, this is where uh, Dr. Drew, or can I call you Drew? Yeah, what Drew's you like fine. Drew's great. Drew's great. Drew's great. Drew's <laughs> great. Dr. Honor. Drew has has that ring. Has a ring, but I, I'm, I'm happier to have <laughs> Dr. Porges calling me Drew. It makes me feel good. Well, call me Steve. Okay. Please. Okay, so uh, the, the issue is really that m- the middle ear muscles, if you have a history, like abuse history, like you're trying to attribute to Adam, which I'm not sure is real or not. It's not abuse. Uh, <laughs> it's it's neglect. The, neglect. Neglect is okay, abuse. Okay, if you okay. have abuse history, then your ears don't tense and you try to pick up low-frequency sounds because they trigger predator. They're, they're the indicator of predator. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so that's what Adam seems to have a really a, 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 a good skill set for. Well, let's and make sure so, I get that right. His ears don't tense. How does that equate with the trauma? Well, it's basically saying that uh, he's uh, always trying to pick up the sounds of potential predator in his environment. I'm not saying Which it's is what is, it's just hypervigilance again. This is the it's part a different of it. Yeah. form. Yeah. Your your hypervigilance and Drew is really to be mobilized. Yes. To keep moving. Yes. Adams is to detect the low frequency sounds of something bad that may happen. So he's and anticipating he, strike. Yeah. I'm anticipating he, flee fleeing. <laughs> he, he's anticipating strike. That's true. That's how that's looked he, at. He's a complicated guy, you know. He's oh, not shit. just funny. Uh, <laughs> but no one understands uh, me like my woman, <laughs> as the great Shaft would say. Yeah. Well, yeah, well it, it, but but now here's the thing. If you if you give me music I enjoy, I yeah. like listening to it as loud as possible. Uh, if you give me music I don't that's enjoy, not, I'm, I want to kill that's myself. That's not the question of whether you like it loud or not. The question is when it's playing and you're attending to it. Are you filtering out other things uh, in the acoustic environment? No, I I hear everything. I no hear what, every conversation. No matter what, I hear everything. But do you like that or don't like that? Well, I can tell you this, as I, I, I tell people all the time, Steve, with the hyper vigilance. I drive like an asshole, <laughs> and I have never been in a car accident, and. I, let me tell you, everyone else in this town drives like an asshole, and I've avoided a lot of car accidents because when I drive, I profile cars that are quarter mile ahead of me. Chris Maxapata over here will tell you that when we were driving home from Fresno at 3 a.m. on a Saturday night, we pulled up next to a BMW 7 Series, like, coming down the grapevine, and I wasn't driving the car, and we were parallel with the car for a period of time, and I said to Mike August, who was driving, get away from this guy. And he yeah. said, why? And I said, because he's a young man. He's driving a 7 Series BMW. I don't know where he got this car. He must be a drug dealer. The car's new but looks to be in bad shape. This is at night at 3 a.m. Yeah, we're all like half asleep. They're all half asleep in the car. I'm, I'm, I've had four beers, by the way. <laughs> and I said, I don't trust this car. I don't trust the guy who's driving this car. And I said, just pull out. Get away from him. And he got away from it, and we drove away 10 feet, and the tire blew out on the other car, and he, like, Ow. swerved and whatever. Whoa. Yeah. Now, we're just driving along at 3 in the morning. I've had I've had five beers, and I have just did a show in Fresno that night. I should be asleep in the back of the car. I'm on full scan 
mode yeah. with five beers in me at 3 a.m., and I don't like what I see with this BMW. It's a nice BMW. It's not a low rider. It, it also is the source of a lot of his material because comedy is about <laughs> you know it's about exposing truths that he sees that the rest of us don't see. Right. So yeah. I knew that there was something not good about this car. I don't yeah. know why. I couldn't tell you exactly what I didn't like about this car, but I got a very bad vibe at 75 miles an hour at 3 in the morning yeah. when we're the only cars on the freeway yeah. about yeah. the 7 Series based on certain things about the car. And strangely, I have the same vigilance about people. Right. Uh-huh. And I'll get the same instincts about people. I factored in the nationality and the age of the guy <laughs> no, who was I, driving but you the BMW. Look, but you're w. looking at the factoids. I'm looking at how they make me feel. No, I don't. I, I think, okay, so a- Adam's doing a profiling, but yeah. he's not doing it cognitively. Right. So he's only explaining it post hoc cognitively. Post cognitively, yeah. right. At yeah. the time, all I could think of, trouble, yeah. car, get away from this guy. Yeah, I, I actually, when I drive, I do the same thing, and I distance, and very few people distance on the freeways. Have you thought of a career in comedy, Steve? Uh, (laughs) But Steve, that's the whole point. I drive up everyone's ass. I don't distance from anybody. It's just this guy didn't want to be next to. I knew there was nothing that was going to be good that would come from this. Okay, so so Adam, this is what I call neuroception. It's your nervous system evaluating risk without awareness. Mm, Now, that may be comedy. I don't know. You have to read my papers to decide. Uh, I'll but, do them up on stage <laughs> next time. You'll read I them. have a Lenny Bruce moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the people will fall asleep as they normally do. Never mind. But the the issue is, we pick up cues and then we try to figure out why did we feel that way. So, in a sense, you, you were probably picking up some uncertainty in how he was driving or something. And then no, you started to- no, it wasn't in how he was driving. You're just adding up the facts. It's the first thing was. What is a BMW 7 Series uh-huh. doing out at 3 a.m. Yeah. The second on a Saturday night. The second one is what's a 23 year old Armenian guy doing driving a BMW <laughs> 7 Series that looks to be four years old? Can't be good. Second, thirdly, or fourthly, why does this car look like it's in rough shape when it's probably a 2008? Yeah. You know, it looks beat on for it. This doesn't look like a car that's been taken care of. And then my next command was to move. Well, but yeah. he wasn't erratic. He wasn't swerving or doing anything like that or speeding. I just didn't want to be next to the guy, Chris. Yeah, August and I, when you told us, we didn't even know. We, we was like, well, why? Because like, right. your batting average is so high that we just trusted you enough to just do it. <laughs> right, but I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, another one. Sorry, Dr. Steve. That's okay. Yeah. My assistant, Matt, came in here one day wearing uh, eclectic-looking tennis shoes. Nothing bizarre about them, just... They didn't look, they fit him perfectly, but they didn't look like, they were tennis shoes that fit him perfectly, yeah, but they they're, they're something they're Wilson that, white, literally tennis shoes, like you play tennis in them. They're just tennis, they're white leather Wilson tennis shoes, that's all. And I just said, what's up with the shoes? And he said, what do you mean? I said, what's up with the shoes? And he said, I'm tennis shoes? I said, "What? what's up? And he said, nothing, I'm wearing tennis shoes. I said, where'd you get them? <laughs> I said, they're my tennis shoes, and I'm wearing them. I said, no. What's going on? Something's going on. What's the story? And he goes, oh, they're my dad's tennis shoes. Oh. And I said, okay, now now I can keep moving. Well, we always describe it as things coming into focus. That, but that's, but things not, are out that's of focus not wingtip from... shoes. Those no, weren't wingtip shoes. Those are just tennis shoes. Yep. Something jumped out at me and bothered me that my assistant was wearing just white tennis shoes. It didn't, but, it didn't seem like his shoes. So, Adam, in, in your life, are all incongruities or inconsistency things that basically immobilize you, in a, you know, stop you? I don't mean immobilize and shut you down. He shuts the rest of us down. I want yeah. to know what the story is. I want to know what the story is. And when I see uh, a behavioral activity, uh, as, uh, as I've said many times, my wife wanting to know oh, yeah. where the rubbing compound was to get the scuff out of the side of her Jaguar that I alerted her to six months earlier, and many times after that that she uh, gl- that she elected to not do anything about. All of but a sudden, interesting. One Sunday morning when she said, where is that uh, rubbing compound stuff you said was in the garage? I want to take care of that scuff on the car. I just said, why? <laughs> and she said, I want to take care of the scuff on the car. You've asked me to do it 400 times, now I'm going to do it. And I said, no, I need to know why. And she said, 
I just want to clean up the car. And I said, okay, so, well, hold so on. I said, I said, no. I said, what's going on? And she said, nothing. And I said, what are you doing? What are you doing later today? And she said, I'm, I'm picking up Nils Lofgren, who's the guitar player from the East Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. And I said, oh, okay. That's now fine. I know what you're doing. You're cleaning the car up for him. All right. Okay. But I'm not angry and I'm not anything. I'm just, I need to know this uh-huh. doesn't fit your pattern. Uh, We've had many Sundays between the time I pointed out to you and the time Nils came to LAX where you didn't do anything. So now I've seen a pattern change, and I want to know what's going on with the pattern change. Okay. So, Adam, is it hard for you to trust people? Um, no, it's hard for me to trust certain people because I study patterns, meaning... Okay. I don't, I'm not one of these people like, I don't trust anybody. I trust everyone. Look, I have a shop here. Do I ever lock this place up? No. Do I ever open it up? Do you even have keys? I don't have keys. I wanted to come here on Saturday and get something. I don't have keys to my own shop. Yeah. Everybody has a set of keys. Because you trust these guys to open and lock it. And shut it. Right, but I know them. Yeah. I understand them. Yeah. There are people I say things to one time, and I walk away. And I never say it again. And then there's people I say to one time, and then I come back the next day and I go, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? I follow them around because a pattern you know. has been established. So there's people I trust ex- exceedingly, and then there's people I really don't trust at all. But it's all based on their pattern that yeah. they've set. I trust everybody until they're, I figured out their pattern. And if they give a pattern that I figured out, then some I don't trust and some I do. Everyone else has the keys to everything but, I but have. You see, everything boils down to very pragmatic reality, like what they're doing, they're behaving, how are they doing, you know, you know what I mean? They have not whether I trust them to be close to me or whether I can feel comfortable and vulnerable with them. It's just what I can rely on them to do. But I'd say if the answer is, do I trust people? Yes. Yes, he does. Well, I do. It, it almost, I, have a, I don't know if this is my role here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but over time, uh, do you feel that... Uh, people have violated your trust you know is it does the circle get smaller mm, i i feel like it's a, there's a little revolving door sometimes people leave new people yeah. enter um and he complains about a lot of stuff not that i i it's not a trust thing it's it's more of a i get taken advantage of sometimes it's not uh, but but maybe it's a filter of, of to find the select few or group that you feel comfortable with that it's not it's truly adaptive that there's nothing wrong with being uh, judgmental in this case. No, I, no. There's people who are fuck ups who will take advantage of you who will not execute things you need them to execute and they they but get filtered out. This carries on to your sort of let's call it a moral compass right and wrong, your scales of right and wrong. And he expects everybody else to have the exact same mm. clarity. There's no uh-huh. no gray on people's, you know, he, he like like we were talking earlier about your dad and him doing the podcast here. Mm-hmm. You know, when he didn't pull his weight, he was gone. Yeah, but it's your dad, and he's hurt by it. Yeah, yeah, well, I told him, I gave him an opportunity, he fucked up, and that's that, he's gone. Here's what I find. You're saying, hey, man, people make a lot of mistakes because they're cashiers, and they're constantly making change. And I say, that's fine, except for when they're constantly shortchanging the customer and leaving more in their till, then there's something going on. I don't mind the cashier that screws up. One day, they get an extra five bucks. One day, I get an extra five bucks. But when every day they get an extra five bucks, they're not bad at math. They're fucking up in their direction constantly and that is an agenda and that's where i don't buy the hey man i'm just screwed up with the math why is it every time you screw up with the math you screw up in your favor that's what i don't buy and that's what i won't tolerate (laughs) hey dr steve i have to uh go out there and cause an accident unfortunately yes but you You, and and drew are 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 free to uh dissect me that's good we can are we allowed to? Will you listen to what we say no. about you want to leave? I will not. But I will share it with him, I promise you. <laughs> I will I not. It, it doesn't even say whatever you like. And, and believe me, the staff here will be very interested in what we have to say. Uh huh. Well, listen, it's been a joy talking to you. Thank you, Doc. Joy, Adam. You I created, appreciate you that. brought joy. Well, I got to tell you that both of you are, you know, my kids, my two sons are big fans of both of you. Thank and, you. Uh, 
and so this is important to them that I'm on, on this show. I can tell, <laughs> picking up your vocal patterns, your by the prosody. way, that uh, you got a lot of nerd in you, <laughs> and that you're a great student. Um, he, he sounds, his vocal, his vocal quality is a lot like Tom Burbine, who was the astrophysicist who named the asteroid oh yes after us who has showed up in many of our shows by the way yes now dr steve is not nearly as far gone as tom burbine is but a genius yeah in the voice and i can hear a lot of the same tonal qualities. inflections yeah, and yeah. qualities in that person yes, that's true it's interesting they're so, very similar they and i i because i have an image of dr porges in my head because i've seen him in books and things very different than our other buddy so, but so, so in, in my head, I translated his I voice would differently. Say but you're right. Both intellectual geniuses. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And bad at sports. Well, I appreciate. <laughs> right. I appreciate that. Thank you, Gorgeous. Nice Hold on one second. I got to do a little sure. business here, so Crow Great. allows me to keep doing the podcast. Uh, thanks, Adam. Thank you. We'll talk, keep talking about you behind your back here. Love Oxy, everybody. Love Ocracy, a place to discover, share, and shop cool products. For savvy shoppers, browse collections in your circle or check out what's trending across the entire Loveocracy catalog. Products are added from ever on the web. My wife loves this thing. You can share with anyone, create a Loveocracy collection of the products that they love and share it with friends, people you trust. Whether it's the clothes in your wardrobe or the books on your shelves, you'll be able to share what you love with the people who care. You can also get a great buy on Loveocracy. Our team of expert shopping assistants will track down the lowest price from the most reliable retailers so that you will not have to hunt down the products you want. Simply buy with a click and you are done. They will find the stuff for you. And again, the stuff you want to share with other people right there with a click. Join Lovocracy today and you will receive a $10 credit to purchase anything on the site. It's 10 bucks just by signing up. That is L-U-V-O-C-R-A-C-Y. Lovocracy.com. Trust me, you will L-U-V it. You will love it. All right, now I get to go back, Doctor Porges. Okay. All right, Steve. Um, so let's let's. I, I've got so much for you, and again, I hope you'll come back again. And your sons, by the way, are, if they're ever in Southern California, please have them contact uh, Gary or me, and we'd be, love to have them here as a guest. Yeah. yeah they, l- 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 let me tell you briefly. Uh, one's a neuroscientist. Fantastic. And, and the other one's a tech writer. Oh my and, god. Uh, and actually, I'll send you the links to some of the things the tech writer's done. And uh, he's he's on TV a lot. He's they're really in, both kids are entertaining, bright and interesting. So uh, S- send up uh, send Gary an email. Send you an email, and uh, if you if Adam and I are in the vicinity, uh, you're North Carolina right now, yeah. Yeah. If we're out there, we will contact you or or where your kids are. Yeah. We'd be happy to set you guys up anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere you're close to, we'd be happy to do it. Be great. Great. Wonderful. Okay. So here's the deal. First of all, I want to start with an apology, which is. Um, I know you went through a surgery lately, right? Yeah. And I did, too. Ah. Uh, and it caused me to divert my attention from the emails you have sent me, and I literally have them set aside like I can't wait to sit and study ah. what you've sent, but I had a prostatectomy, and I believe you had the same thing. Is that right? I had the, yeah, I had the same thing. Yeah. Mine was August 2nd. When did you have yours? Uh, June 20th. Oh. And it kicked the crap out of me, even though everything was very successful and... Uh, I'm, you know, symptom free. Great. How are and, you? And, oh, I, I'm one of the lucky ones, also. So, in fact, post-surgery uh, pathology was better than pre than biopsy, and margins were clean. And um, I was on on the elliptical this morning for two and a half miles. Great. My, my surge, my post-op pathology was worse. I, I had a an a tributary heading towards the capsule and was merely millimeters away, yeah. and it was all low grade, but going for Mecca. Uh, going for the clear, and so I thank oh, God wow. I had it done. And um, I, I, you said you had wanted to raise some issues about the polyvagal theory as it played out in your surgical. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, actually, yeah. So it was a very interesting personal journey because, as you know, diagnosis is very disruptive. Mm-hmm. You went through that as well, I'm sure. And for me, I had to go through literally training for surgery. Now I'm a little bit. Uh, you're 50 what? I 50, can't 55. 50. Yeah. So I'm 68. And so you start getting into this age bit. Uh, physically, I'm not a nerd. I'm actually <laughs> <laughs> reasonably robust. And But I went into physical training uh, for the surgery, and I had to, in a sense, cancel obligations, So just, which you probably had to do also. Mm-hmm. 
I I cleared my calendar, and this was the hardest thing for me to do because and, and my basal heart rate dropped ten beats per minute, not by the diagnosis, but by dropping work. Huh. And so I in a sense had to say, you know what, you know, three months I'm going to take off. I'm going to see what's happening. In fact, you today is my, this is my first public or interaction with people. Wow. Uh, so um, because you're special. Oh. Okay. <laughs> or my, my heart rate's going up. It, yeah. So so I went through, in a sense, the physical, trying to get into physical shape for surgery, and then I went through a whole set of visualizations to be comfortable in surgery. You know, try, and it was really quite interesting. So when I was in the operating room, uh, my heart rate was 69 beats per minute. Yeah. I was there talking to the anesthesiologist before. So I was actually like Adam <laughs> in this situation before surgery. But I also, once I got diagnosed... I used an old-fashioned technique, denial. Uh, yeah, denial and <laughs> kept, fear. Kept, yeah. It kept yeah, my heart like, rate nice and slow, too. Yeah, you're just like Dorothy yeah. in, in The Wizard of Oz. You're yeah. cooking your heels at a fast rate. Yeah. And I want to go home. Um, that wouldn't work. I, you know, I was sure that wouldn't work for me. I had to, in a sense, literally invite this to happen to me so I could recover easily. But the other part, which I would like to really share, is when I got the diagnosis, I, uh, which was in in April. Uh, and just to clarify for the listeners, we're talking about prostate cancer. Yeah, so I got a diagnosis in April, and I delayed surgery until August because I had lots of uh, speaking. I had two European trips. I had a variety of other talks at universities and various groups. And those talks and those conferences and those workshops were the most wonderful ones I'd ever attended because to me it was like. This may be my last time uh, doing this, wow. and I felt so connected with the people uh. that it provided me with the whole sense of validation in who I was. Huh. And you, you understand what I'm, I'm oh, saying? Yes. This, this, uh, you can't go into these surgeries and these illnesses with a, with a fear that you haven't done your life's work or you hadn't done things. Mm. You have to basically be comfortable with who you are and comfortable with your family and comfortable with, with everything. And that's how I went through it. And then I had to go through, all, as you did, all the basic next steps of, you know, these recovery symptoms and everything. And fortunately, um, the side effects have been minimal. You had the uh, for Da Vinci robot? Yes, I did. Uh, which, fortunately, I didn't look at any of the videos before I had the I know. Surgery. Me neither. In fact, somebody sent me an email, a guy who I actually want to have on the show, who yeah. had it done at one of the competing institutions here locally. Yeah. And uh, he was going, oh, I hope you're aware of this procedure. I mean, well, it just so happens I am. And uh, so when they were pulling the robot out, they tore my aorta, and I'm oh. still in the hospital. <laughs> oh, my God, if I'd read this beforehand. Oh. Oh. So. so you had some, some complications. No, I did not. No, this was this guy that sent me the email. Oh. I, I was all free and clear. Mine was beautiful. Mine was yeah. spectacular. I mean, I'm amazed. And remember, we have to remind ourselves. 20 years ago, this was a three-week hospitalization with an open procedure. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, you went home in 24 hours, right? 24 hours, although I was yeah. a wreck for a couple of weeks. Uh, um, I was a wreck. Oh, I, I, I will tell you that within a week, a, a week, um, I went to the airport to pick up my kids with the, uh, I didn't drive, but I went to the airport with my uh, bag <laughs> on my side. Do you mean the, the urinary bag, the catheter? Yes, yes I wore my yes. catheter for a nice yes. week and a half, too. Yeah. And, uh, a week, week. and the day they pulled out the catheter, oh, yeah. I, I I drove and went to a restaurant, and and had a beer. Okay, nice, so, that's so, good. Uh, beer is good for the urogenital you know, tract. Oh yeah, yeah. It, you, you realize that will teach you that, and some uh, coffee will teach you or tell you how well you are. That's right. But coffee's the other thing. The, no beer and the, coffee are, are irritating to the, the bladder and urethra. The staff's looking at me like, huh? No, 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 I couldn't tell you made it. You made a face, but you can't hear that over yeah. the podcast. Okay, I didn't know it, if that no, was it, it is irritating. It is irritating. Yeah, yeah. But the, the issue was uh, the journey was getting connected, kind of feeling, getting into training. But the other part was to conceptualize what this was all about. In general, prostate cancer is really conceptually a diseased or damaged prostate. It's nothing more. And you have to literally partition your thinking about it as opposed to a uncontrollable cancer. Well, it can become an uncontrollable cancer. Though. Um, but how, yeah, but if yeah, but it yeah, depending upon the grade and depending upon whether it's contained within the capsule. That's the and, point. I mean, it's dangerous. And, and even that 
is really debatable about whether the low-grade cancers become the high-grade cancers in the prostate, even though they, they basically tell you they will. I'm not even sure, because there are a lot of these uh, low-grade cancers that people have for a lifetime. Yeah, but, well, I was actually, let me my, tell you my story, I was on active surveillance, so I was getting biopsied. Oh, oh yeah. so you were. Yeah, I was, I had, my diagnosis was actually years ago. And I went. I that's one of the the reasons I keep bringing my story up. I want men that have this problem to not rush to get their cancer out because it's yeah. not clear who should have it. But I always had more volume than I should have had, uh-huh. and it's the grade started deteriorating and the volume started expanding, and uh-huh. the and there was a, the intuition of my urologist was that we should do this, and as I said, there was clearly a tributary aggressively heading for the surface. So oh. there is something about the behavior of this. So the grade is not the whole story either. No. So it's a really intri- – we don't fully understand. It's probably an array of illnesses, prostate cancer, yeah. and it's and probably with different manifestations at different ages. It's a very interesting illness. Uh, but you're right. It's complicated. It, we don't yeah. know for sure. But we can tell pre- – your age, my age, the we would probably be accurate to say, overwhelmingly accurate to say, your life would be shortened if we didn't do something. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, my pro- my prostate was basically healthy. It was a it weighed about forty grams, which is a healthy size. Yep. I didn't have any hyperplasia on it, yep. and uh, the I had one. I, I had six of the twelve cores were lateralized with cancer, but one was a uh, grade seven. You know, yeah. It was a Gleason seven. Uh, and so I think that, I went up to a seven. Event over time, I became a seven. Yeah, and that's that's when you don't have choices. You don't have yeah. active surveillance. Yeah. That's when they, but when they took the thing out, it was only five percent of my yeah, uh, prostate. Yeah, that and, was basically the same story. Yeah, uh, but my surgery was five and a half hours. With Mine was the robot. four. Mine was four. Oh, so you, and that had to do. That's actually long, also. Yeah. And, and what they were doing is really trimming because they wanted to make sure things that were sticking out, which you you had as well. I had something sticking out, and uh, they were very careful in uh, literally shaving around it. Um, yeah, and I, my functions are all normal. Yours? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, let me. I'm running out of time. I want to switch gears to. I want to give people again another primer on the polyvagal theory, because uh, again, I, I just think it's such an important thing to revisit and just just sort of give the landscape of your theory. I want you back again. I thank you for analyzing Mr. Corolla because <laughs> I've, I've been constantly assessing him through the prism of the polyvagal theory. So I was fascinated by your. Uh, Assessments. Before we go on, I got to do one more piece of business, then we can finish up the landscape of the polyvagal theory. I got to mention our friends at GoToMeeting. For instance, Dr. Porges and I, if we were going to get together, we would use GoToMeeting. I guarantee it because it's a high definition conference right there on your computer. However, you can launch these meetings from your phone, your iPad, any portable device, smartphone, whatever it might be, and computers, obviously. And you can throw up your documents right on the screen, and then we can work on one of those documents. Dr. Porges can actually put his prostate pathology up there. I can have a good look at it while we are having our meeting with HD Faces. Again, we use GoToMeeting with HD Faces a lot here. You're all on the same screen. We love GoToMeeting. We've used it a million times. I'd say, would you guys agree that every Corolla meeting that can't be face to face is a GoToMeeting meeting? Absolutely. I, 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 I every think. new sponsor we get, we use this yeah, absolutely. product. Absolutely. Exactly right. So here's what I want you to do try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. Again, I don't know how they afford to do this, but they will give it to you for free. Do not wait for this. Do not wait. Here's the special offer. Visit gotomeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button. Use the promo code Dr. Drew, Dr. Drew, D-R-D-R-E-W. Remember to use that promo code, Dr. Drew, and go to meeting now. Okay, Dr. Porges, let's go ahead and give us the basic oh. outline of the polyvagal theory so okay. people that I, haven't I, heard this before will get it. Okay, and I'm actually going to uh, cast it within a different model of trauma, this type of trauma from uh, diagnostic uh, uh, being getting a diagnosis. Yeah. So, so what the polyvagal theory does, it, it provides you with an understanding of three different response systems that we have. To and, and by the way, before you, I'm going to interview up you a lot because I'm excited about this theory. I presented it to the first year medical students over at USC, and I I made all of my test questions about your polyvagal theory. Oh. And and I put it, I embedded it in an overall conversation about affect regulation and about addiction, mm. which was interesting. Uh, I actually sent uh, Gary an abstract 
and I want to talk to you at some point about addiction through the lens of the polyvagal You got theory. it. You got it. Okay. So, but let's go with the theory basically says that uh, we have three different underlying uh, autonomic nervous systems or circuits, and the autonomic nervous system is what basically regulates our viscera and our heart. It provides us literally with the energy we need to act out our behavior. And, and I would say it's also... It embeds our emotional system in ways we don't fully understand. It's, it's yeah. our emotions are embedded in the autonomic system. Right, and even like concepts like anxiety or are really uh, reflections of autonomic state or yes. physiology, yes. how we label it. Uh, and even if Adam doesn't really truly uh, uh, <laughs> detect how he's really feeling, we need to put monitors on right. Him. Then, then we'll know. There would but, be peripheral manifestations of some yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the theory um, basically says that w- uh, within the human uh, autonomic nervous system, we retain circuits that were there uh, phylogenetically in more primitive vertebrates. And what we have is really we have a new uh, autonomic nervous system that's linked with our face. It provides us with regulation of our underlying viscera, it makes us calm because as mammals we need to engage other mammals we're not isolates uh we need to be calm and we need to signal others so it basically says the regulation of our heart is linked to the regulation of our face and so in many and, ways and and that and those facial expressions are tra- yeah. are signals to yeah. others to calm or not calm absolutely yeah. uh, so we wear our heart on our face, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's not it's a metaphor, but it's neurophysiologically based. But it's so strange to me, if I could interrupt you there, that you know, it, it, the the <laughs> the literary and poetic heritage of the world is embedded in vagal efferents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you know oh, what I mean? Yeah. We we never talk about that. That, ah, that the uh, it's we, also embedded in vagal afferents, afferents too. Hits, yeah, when exactly. When you the pit of your stomach, right? That we have uh, talked about. It, we have a feeling in our heart. That is the vagus nerve yeah. sending information back to our brain, and we yeah. it, I, I, we never talk about that. That that yeah. there is literally a and it's pro, it's and it's probably also connected to the the plexus there, the nervous plexus, yeah. which is sort of a, another brain in a way. Yeah. So, so in the model, we have, you know, since the wearing of your, your heart on your face, but this is the very uh, most mature and it's the ability to use other people to calm ourselves down. Uh, and uh, below that, we have older neural circuits, like a circuit that supports mobilization, and this was the sympathetic nervous system that you were alluding to earlier, and that helps us uh, run or to flee or to fight. But... We had been taught, literally historically, all of us, that we really had a one defense system, and that was a fight-flight. But that's not really true. We really have an older defense system, which is also regulated by our autonomic nervous system and also regulated by the vagus. And this is a shutting-down system, and this is linked to basically the organs subdiaphragmatically below our diaphragm. And this is where when people, when they get scared to death, they often will defecate or urinate. And, you know, for both of us, having had subdiaphragmatic surgery, we understand how vulnerable that, that part of our body is and the cues that it gives back to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- basically there's a hierarchy here that when we're first challenged, we use our facial system and we engage people and we use prosody. And if that doesn't serve to uh, put us in a safe place, we mobilize or fight or flee, and if that doesn't work, we kind of get out, try to disappear by fainting or shutting down like a reptile would. And that's, uh, in a nutshell, what the polyvagal theory is. The polyvagal theory also provides you with a model or a way of how you get into these different states, and it attributes that to our, our nervous system evaluating risk in the environment without cognitive awareness. So our this is part of that discussion with Adam. What are the cues that you're really picking up? And what our nervous system is tuned to is picking up those uh, facial expresses, expressions that you were talking about, but also the prosody of human voice. Uh, and we, you know, I discussed some of this other material about the dissociation or freeze response with Dr. Yeah. Shore. Uh, Gary, would you put up the episode, the Alan Shore episodes? Uh, I can refer people to that if they're interested. It's, I also, I was just thinking. I, I referred to the 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 plexus in the in the um, midpoint in our abdomen, in the, near the sternum, 
as a uh, as a separate brain in a way. And I heard a quote from Freud recently said that at one point he was considering the central nervous system just another sympathetic ganglion. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting way of thinking about that. Uh, is so it's it, would it be right to characterize it as, as strike or anticipating strike, fight or flight? Um, because the anticipation you, when, of strike is the is the metabolically conservative shutdown. Well, should, not exactly. No. No. The anticipation of strike is solely a vagal withdrawal. This is really uh, what hypervigilance is, and we as humans who who pay attention, who are students, who work at computer monitors, we withdraw our vagal tone when we sustain our attention. Mm -hmm. So we create this focused attention at the cost of pulling back our vagus. That's why it's exhausting to work uh, intellectually. And so what we're really doing is simulating the anticipation of something happening. And and if we really think strike is inevitable, that's when we go into Ah, shutdown. but you see, that shutdown is not a discognitive decision. It's our body may just respond to it. So let's move that into diagnosis. So when some people get diagnoses of cancer, they functionally shut down. Right. They they can't move. They become, you know, we, we use words like depressed, but they're exhausted, totally exhausted. And, they you know, their body becomes almost limp. And other people become scared, and they become mobilized. And I think we have misinterpreted the whole concept of fighting illness. So we we almost say that if you get a diagnosis, you have to fight it. But really what we want is when you get the diagnosis, you want that uh, uh, myelinate vagus, the new autonomic circuit, to help regulate the rest of your body. So you need to be calm and engaging, and you need other engaging with other people. So so the new autonomic vagus is the social... Vegas. Yeah, yeah. It, and more than social, it's literally enables the sympathetic and the old Vegas to to do their homeostatic duties. So your Freeze autonomic, them to do that. Yeah, your autonomic nervous system is not merely defense systems. It has to do with lots of maintenance and work. But if it's being recruited in defense, it's turning off all that. So we know that if you're mobilized, you turn off subdiaphragmatic function. Your di- digestion stops. So this and, is almost yeah. mindfulness and meditating is what yeah. allows that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Or being present or, with, you know, listening to Adam. Is, Adam's complicated. No I, kidding. It's going, to, it's going to take me a while. <laughs> <laughs> to work it out? Well, as soon as you figure it out, call yeah. me because I'll share it with the staff. By oh, okay. the way, the Dr. Shore episode is episode 65. Dr. Portis, this brings us to the end of my time with you. And, again, I could talk to you all day. Thank you for reviewing The Polyvagal Theory. If you, those of you who are interested, the book is The Polyvagal Theory, and Neurophysiological Foundations of Emotions, Attachment, and Communication, and Self-Regulation. And if if I have it right, that really is a compilation of papers. Is that right, Dr. Shor- Dr. Portis? Correct. Yeah. And sort of they chronicle the evolution of your thinking in a way, which we originally mm-hmm. were observing newborns in uh, intensive care units. Yes. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Dr. Porges is a professor of psychiatry at University of North Carolina. I will definitely have him back. And we, will, as I said, as Gary pointed out, we will meet with his sons wherever they are. A new book that Dr. Porges is working on is The Clinical Applications of the Polyvagal Theory, which you saw evidence of here today in our discussion about Mr. Corolla. The, the subtitle of that book is The Transformative Power of Feeling Safe. Okay, Steve, that just does it for us today. I, I would again, I, I appreciate you being here, and congratulations on the success of your procedure. And uh, yours too. Thank you. I know the feeling. It is, it is yeah. a good one to be through the woods, you know, out of the woods, and all that. I'll yeah, tell you what. Congratulations. On thank that. you. You too. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Great. All right. Bye-bye. Take care now. That does it, Doctor Podcast. We'll see you next time. Digital.